church. Uh, if I'm not looking at you right now, then I know that you're watching it on the internet. Um, we would rather you be here in in house, but if you can't make it for whatever reason, we're just glad that you're watching it there. We're going to be in First Timothy chapter five, five verse seventeen tonight. Uh, we're going to probably finish up First Timothy tonight. I don't know how much I talk and how much Brent interrupts, so we will see how that goes. Uh, I want to remind everybody, of course, this is a Wednesday night Bible study. We start at 6.45 every Wednesday evening. Um, if you're anywhere close, come on in and do it in person. Uh, on Sunday mornings at 9 a.m., we do RCC TV on YouTube. We also have it uh, posted on Taken TV Network, uh, which is on most smart TV apps, and they have their own app if you want to get it on your Android or your iPhone. Uh, then, of course... 10 o'clock, we stream our live uh, service at, on Facebook at 10 a.m. on Sunday mornings. Uh, I mentioned taking TV, all of our uh, Sunday service, Sunday Spanish service, uh, RCC TV, and this Wednesday Bible study are all on taking TV and they're on YouTube, whatever is easier for you to get it. Uh, let's uh, I want to remind everybody about our book. This is our prayer book. It's not a prayer request book. If you have a prayer request, please send them in to the uh, address that will be on the screen. But this is a list of names of people who we pray over. We pray over it probably here at the church now. We've got so much going on, seven days a week at least. And then most of us pray over it when we're at home. Uh, God knows what you need. And everybody needs prayer. So if you'll put your name, if you'll send in your name, we'll put it in this here book. If you'll send a good mailing address so Pastor Woody can uh, send you a encouraging letter and a Rockin' Country Church is praying for me decal. Uh, you can put this wherever you want to that will remind you that this little church here in Kemp, Texas is praying for you. We're praying for you because we love you. We love you because God loves you. And that is what part of the kingdom is. is uh, we, uh, Jesus commands us to love each other, and by that people will know who we are. Uh, we're going to do our prayer and praise reports today. Uh, let's start with Kenneth. All righty. Uh, my family, our church family, uh, still praying for my half-sister, Kenda. She has a, a slow-growing cancer on her liver. And two unspoken. Okay. <clears throat> Carol? Okay. Uh, William and I, my family, <clears throat> uh, my church family, the election, all those that are sick, everyone here, and those that couldn't be here, um, the lost, the fallen away, travel mercies for Woody and Terry, and uh, Jack's prayer. Mm -hmm. That's it for me. Margo? Um, Terry and Woody, uh, my church, my family, you and Lori, Carolyn and William, thank you, Beverly and Ted, Colleen, Carol Life, American Heritage, Linda Moy, Kenneth, Edie and Thomas, and that's all. Mm -hmm. Oh, and Christina and Michael, my granddaughter. Okay. That's it. Um, I have a little different tonight. Okay. Jack, a Jack's prayer and then prayer still. Oh, it was short and sweet. You can't do that. That's his job. <laughs> you had, his you job. hadn't heard that's what I said. Yeah. Oh, she's she's been beating him lately. <laughs> <laughs> she usually says prayer squall. Yeah. Well, that's, that covers everything. There you go. Ah, it says slow connection wheel, okay? Just go with it. Okay, um, so I stand in agreement with everyone's prayers, and uh, I've got a special prayer for my oldest daughter, Amanda. She went to the eye doctor. Um, she has been having some trouble with her eyes, and uh, uh, she has a, a, a tumor on her pituitary gland that she has been kind of struggling with for the last probably 15 years and that may be what's it may be pressing on her optic nerve causing um, her sight to grow just gray in both eyes at the same time 
Yeah. She drives to and from work two hours mm. one way. And uh, so, <coughs> her name again? Amanda. Thank you. And um, so, uh, praying for her safety, praying for uh, the, the eye doctor she saw did a very new thing. They drew some blood and spun it out and gave it back to her in little eye drop containers of her plasma. And so she drops plasma, her own plasma, in her eyes uh, mm -hmm. several times a day. Uh, and uh, so we're, we're praying that that's going to work and she will won't have to um, deal with the tumor on the pituitary gland. So, um, also want to pray for uh, the awakening of uh, our church, the, the whole church across the United States, uh, to be educated in what is um, all the candidates that are running for all the different offices in our election, upcoming election, so that we can be uh, educated, make an educated vote, and not get there at the last minute and say, oh, yeah, I've heard that name. I'll vote for that one. Yeah. <laughs> you know, so, um, yeah, just, uh, um, that, that's, that's it. Uh -huh. Thomas? I use a short sleeve. Is that me? I agree with the short part. Uh, I'm not going to hang with you on the sweet part. He is me too. I agree. Ms. E. Thomas and I, my sister Sue and Dina and their family, Holly and Gary and their family, Patricia and Timothy and their family, Myra and her family, well, they were out on a 18 day cruise. Mm -hmm. uh, Tara and Woody on their trip, our church. Trump, hopefully, he'll be able to be alive when it's time to vote. <laughs> really? Because I don't think anybody's trying to take anything away. The, it's, I don't, they don't look at him like they look at everybody else. Yeah. And uh, I'm just kind of worried about him. I know that sounds silly to be being worried yeah. about him, but I think that uh, if he makes it to vote today, he'll be doing good. Yeah. Uh, our country, and I can't read the word I wrote. So I think I said all. When Brent? I didn't get the oh. picture. All right, first of all, I just want to give God praise for uh, the, the ministries that we have here at the church, just for showing us with blessings and the things that we're able to do with the kids and for the leaders and parents that are finally coming to the forefront and stepping up. Uh, I want to say a prayer for the majors. Uh, I know I think they're on vacation, but I hadn't seen them in a while. So uh, I pray that they're okay. Uh, I also want to give uh, travel mercies for Pastor Woody and Terry as they make their way towards Georgia. Uh, just ask that they'd have a good time and a safe return. I want to pray for a continued healing for Clark after his uh, heart surgery, that he's doing well. Uh, continue to pray for you and your hand there, Chris, that you get the prosthetics or they get you fixed up, whatever you need. I uh, also want to uh, lift up all the people that aren't here that need to be here. Uh, the lost and fallen away. I ask prayers for Becky and myself and for our country that the young people be more woke than they are. They say they're woke, but I don't know what they woke to because it wasn't reality. So I hope that uh, the country is really paying attention in the oncoming elections. And I have uh, two unspokens. That'll do me, brother. All right. Anybody on? Anything online? Terry is there. Says, our usual, God's blessings to you all. Kathy Trevino is praying for the elections. That's what she's got there. And uh, that's all I see right now. All right. Uh, of course, my to Pastor Woody and Terry for the travels, uh, for the leadership of the church, everyone in the congregation. And I'm, I'm pressing that this week because I believe our church is 
is growing spiritually. We may not see it necessarily every week in the physical growth, but I do believe it's spiritual, and I believe that uh, we got warfare on us because I know we've all kind of been grumbly. I have been, and I know that it's because when good things start happening, the enemy doesn't like it, and he starts starts coming at you. And I do believe between trail life, uh, with the way our our Sunday uh, children's church and, and, and we're growing. I mean, every week we see we see new people here. Um, I believe that our congregation, along with the leadership, are all under attack uh, spiritually. Of course, everyone here, me and Lori, and our healing, Bobby, um, both of our me and Lori's families, and I got two unspoken. Um, what you were talking about, Brenda, about experimental stuff. Uh, sometimes you. Prayer works. So when they did my thumb, that skin on my thumb, they told me it was a 20% chance it would work. And if it didn't, I was going to lose the rest of my thumb. Yeah. It worked. And I still got my thumb. So Amen. prayer works. Amen. Um, and, and generally speaking, especially with a lot of these procedures, we have to remember that these procedures are capable because God gave them to us. Amen. Um, everything that happens, He has created and He has allowed to happen. And that's both sides. So... Uh, just, he gives us all knowledge. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Because mm -hmm. I mean, you know, you have these the smart people who who think they got smart on their own, but they got smart because God allowed them to get smart, and God gives them the things. Especially, it's always humorous to me when something like a cure for something happens, and they've been right there at it for years. They just had that one missing component, and then God finally went, "It's time," and He gives them that component. So, it, it's really good, and and we do want to pray for our leaders, all of them. Uh, we want to pray for our people in our country. Um, our country's problem isn't politicians. Our country's problem is the people who <coughs> vote for the politicians. Um, and this is, we live in a country that's not informed about reality. And if we don't, well, we've all read the book. We, we know what he's done, done a Bible study on this, and we've all read the end of the book, so we know that. Uh, it's probably not going to get a whole lot better, but our job day in and day out is to go out and tell people about Jesus. Because what's worse than having certain people in office is the people who aren't saved, the people who don't know Christ. And we don't want to be, we don't want to miss people. You know, We can't save them, but we want to make sure that we certainly, every opportunity we have. Last night, I was out of the blue, we, we got back to the, the truck and... Uh, we prayed over the, the little girl who was driving the golf cart. You know, the opportunity presented itself unexpectedly, and we were able to do it. And that's what we always have to remember to do, because that's what really matters. Um, so I'm going to open us up in prayer, and then we will get started. Dear Lord, we just thank you for allowing us to gather tonight. We thank you for this Bible study. We thank you for the book that we are going through. We pray that you will open our hearts and our minds. Give us the answers to any questions that we may have. Um, lead us through this, the rest of this book and uh, showing us what you meant for us to know as we go through it. We pray that you'll be with the people on a prayer list, um, that you'll be with everybody who's traveling right now and just allow us to uh, follow your will. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. 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 All right, so we're going to open it up in... Uh, 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 17. And the, uh, the heading of mine says, Honor the elders. Yeah. Um, That's right. Well, they're not talking about you elder leaders. <laughs> <laughs> or, or as Pastor Woody likes to tell Mountain Time, they're not talking about the elders in the church. They're talking about elders of the church. Um, go ahead and read uh, 17, if you would, please. Let the elders who rule will... Be counted worthy of double honor, especially those who, who labor in the word and doctrine. So, and when we've discussed this before, and Pastor Woody has discussed it before, an elder and a pastor are basically interchangeable. The pastor is always teaching, always preaching, and is generally the head of the church. The elders are qualified to teach and preach. And then they are part of the main leadership of the church according to the way um, it's laid out here in, in Timothy. And Timothy is probably the best 
place to go when you're trying to find out how a church in God's eyes should run because as y'all have been going through uh, each of the positions um, because the pastor, a lot of people think that, that he just kind of comes in once a week and throws out his little message and then uh, goes back to the house. But ultimately, he is the spiritual leader of the flock, the church. Um, in most cases, he's the CEO of the church, and he makes most of the decisions. And then while uh, a lot of mod moderate to large churches have paid staff in smaller churches, such as ours, there's no paid staff. Uh, and that means that the pastor and the elders, everything falls on them. Because uh, like our church, our bylaw says we have a senior pastor and two elders. Whereas right now we have a senior pastor, I'm the associate pastor and an elder, and Raul is our other elder. And all three of us preach and teach, I think uh, consistently preach and teach because although we don't see Raul a lot on the English side, once a month he is preaching in Spanish. Uh, I just wish I spoke Spanish so I could understand what he's saying. But, uh, he always gives Pastor Woody a list. Uh, and, and like with most groups, most churches, you get about 5-10% to 10 of the people who volunteer. So you figure at a membership of about 100 people, you end up with about 5-10 to 10 who actually get in there and help. So there is a lot of stress on the pastor. There is a lot of stress on the elders, on the elders, because their job is to make sure the church is running the way it's supposed to run. Uh, now it's everybody's responsibility to make sure of that that we want to, as members of a church, be mindful of everything that goes on. That's why we always encourage everybody to be in our business meetings on on the second Sunday of the month because it's everybody in the church's responsibility to hold everybody in the church accountable because that's how it should work is accountability on every level um, so the overseers which is the elders and the pastors are definitely worthy of double honor but this doesn't mean that they get double what everybody else gets it just means that we should always be thankful for the sacrifice that they make day in and day out to um, the things they do for the church. Because we know that a pastor studies all week and he goes and sees people from the congregation. Uh, he deals with funerals, he deals with weddings, he deals with the stuff that most of us don't want to deal with. And it's just really, really a tough job. <coughs> and especially if, as Woody has been for the whole time that he's this church has been in existence and I'm in the same boat. We got a full time job and then we got a full time job. So it, it really is a, a double load of the work. Um, in churches that are large enough to have paid staff, they should be paid a fair wage according to what whatever their position is. And where not a lot of the smaller churches are able to do that, it's still. Sometimes it's just thanking them, you know, each and the individual staff. If the congregation would just stop sometimes and thank the secretaries, thank the kitchen workers, thank people like that, it makes a huge, huge difference. Because we do all put in a lot of time. Um, just, I mean, I know looking at everybody in this room, we all put in a lot of time here. Um, some of us need a cop to sleep on <laughs> back because we put in so much time. But. Um, I've always been surprised that Woody even bothers to go home some days. He might as well just have him a cot upstairs in the RCC studio. Um, all right, go ahead and do 18. For the scripture says, You shall not muzzle an ox, for it treads out the grain, and the labor is worthy of his wages. So in Deuteronomy chapter 25, verse 4 is the scripture, and it basically says that... that that's where this uh, comes from. And it says that an ox is provided this food for his work. Everyone should be paid for the work they perform. Uh, I've had this discussion, especially on the, the music side, um, whenever we talk about licensing. And, and I've had people go, well, we're a church. Why are we paying for licensing? Because the people who create the music, that's how they make their living. Um, it's, not, it's not a physical work we do. 
they do as far as a lot of that, but it's it's uh, intellectual property. That's the word I'm looking for. And everybody deserves to get paid for what they do. Because I, I had somebody who was, who I think, really was confused as to why we pay a license to play the music that we play here in church. And it's like me as a mechanic, if I was told that three days a week I had to be here at the church working on cars for free, how would I pay my bills? You know, so everybody deserves to get paid for what they were. And, and if God is going to go out of the way to tell us that as an ox is pulling the plow, he should be able to eat what's on the ground, I think he wants us humans to be treated as well, if not better. You know, it's, it's important that we always remember that we have to work for our money, for our food, for our way, and we also should serve, but if our serving is our work, like a pastor, like full-time people who work in church, then they should get paid. Uh, 19 through 21. Okay. Uh, do not receive an accusation against an elder except from two or three witnesses. Those who are sinning rebuke in the presence of all that the rest also may fear. I charge you before God and the Lord Jesus Christ and the elect angels that you observe these things without prejudice, doing nothing with par partiality. And we all know, or we all should know, I think some people forget sometimes, that pastors and elders <clears throat> and overseers, they're human. And they're going to make mistakes and they're going to sin. Which means that because, but because of their position, they are always open to accusations and slander and, and things like that. Because we've seen that. Some of it true, some of it not. And basically what Paul is saying is just like what it says in Matthew chapter 18 verses 15 through 20 when he talk, they talk about church discipline, we need to make sure that the accusations are true. That's why we want two or three witnesses. And we want to make sure we go through the process of the church discipline. And let's see if I can remember how, how it goes. You, you go to the person first and address the issue. If they don't listen, you take two to three others with you and address it. If they don't listen, then you bring it for the church. Um, and that's true in all aspects. And, and we do know from even in recent times, and, and if you go back through times, pastors are not um, exempt from, from sins and doing sinful stuff. Uh, and a lot of times, not all the time, but a lot of times it's, they don't have the correct accountability in place to stop them from doing that. You need people in your life, I've said it before, we're all delusional, it's just a matter of how delusional we are, and if you don't have people you can trust in your life to come to you and go, that's a sin. Because in the men's group, about a month or so ago, we were asked a question about something that to all of us, or at least most of us, was obviously sin, and we had to correct it in the conversation, but that's what we're here for. Because sometimes we can get blinded by what we're doing and we forget that there's a lot that seems in the gray, but really if you get down to it and talk it out, it is sin. And, and again, everybody is subject to it. Pastors, elders, and overseers are also, but they, because they're in the limelight or the center of attention a lot of times, they get accused, falsely accused many times. So, and that's why the other part is, if you hear accusations, we don't like, we don't want to spread rumors, and that's really difficult sometimes not to do because it's so easy to when you're trying to find out if it's true or not. But it's best to go to the source and ask. Um, I think we don't do that like we used to do in the, in, in uh, times gone by. We. We're afraid that we're going to hurt somebody's feelings, make somebody mad, or offend somebody, so we don't actually go to the source and ask the questions that should be asked. We either agree or disagree, depending on how we feel about it. So it is important to make sure. Because, I mean, one simple accusation, and, and, and we've heard it before in, in the worldly status, that they say, it doesn't matter if it happened but because the accusation is out there, we need to really take it seriously. Mm -hmm. Well, it does matter if it happened or not. Mm -hmm. and, uh, but it's so easy if we do it like that that we can just destroy anybody, which is 
what's happened to our whole political system is it's it's not about the best candidate, it's about who can survive all the mud beans. Mm -hmm. But our big, our big. Yeah. Big, big guy bosses in their churches are just, right now it seems like every time you turn around another church, the, the, the pastor is getting taken for it because he's doing something that he shouldn't be doing in church. Mm -hmm. And maybe um, they're all over the place up there. Yeah, and, and, and a lot of times it is because they get to a point where they think they're either above it or well, they don't think they're going to be caught. It's a long time to mess with a person. Yeah. And you know, you think, how can you let that get by for 11 years? Um, I remember a story by a. Uh, his name's, uh, which you guys hear me talk about him all the time, his name's Steve Farrar, and he, he, he passed away last year, but he was one of the first men's ministry guys. He was start, he was one of the first to start writing books and get them published. But he, he tells a story about a guy, um, uh, he was, I think, in his 60s, he's married, he's got kids. Well, apparently he was having a thing with a 18-year-old that was in a church camp that he ran. And, and Steve was confronting him. And Steve said every time he'd ask him a question, he'd come back with Scripture supporting what he was doing. Now, we know that Scripture doesn't support you having an affair, but in his mind, he was able to pull the Scripture. And he said finally, that because Steve said that his, uh, his gift is picking at scabs. And so when he gets people like that, he just likes to pick. pick. Oh, I know women like that. Uh, but he said... Uh, he said, uh, No, I'm going to pick with a hand shovel, not pick, pick. <laughs> but he said, Finally, the guy turned around and looked at him and said, Don't I deserve to be happy? <laughs> but, I mean, and that's what it is, is, is a lot of times as we're moving through, we, we forget the sinful part of it. We forget what our position is, and we just start believing the lies we're telling ourselves. It's like we've always heard, you know, famous people that they're not living their life, they're living the life of the persona they have created and they start believing the lies. And when you start believing your own lies, that's when you're going to go down pretty fast. Um, and again, that's why it's important to have people in our life that go, that's not true. You're not all that in a box of rocks. <laughs> you know, you're not that special. You're not as handsome as everybody's telling you. Yeah, exactly. Uh, well, I mean, I hear that all the time. You know, and, and, and I said that about, you know, in my case, you know, which we all know with kids, when, when, when especially grandparents or what all that come around, they talk about how sweet the kids, how wonderful the kids are, how great the kids are, and you're going, you don't live with them, you don't know. Quit telling them that. Stop telling them that. Uh, but but it, especially in kids, and as we as adults, if, if, if you are the center of attention, if you are that person that everybody comes to because they feel safe with you, that you're their spiritual leader, and, and eventually you start believing the hype. And once you start believing the hype, then it's either, well, this really isn't a sin, or, well, this is okay because I am, or I need, or I, I, I. And that's the key. When you start going because I, that's the biggest fault. Because I know my biggest enemy is sitting right here. It's not the devil. It's, it's not... Not, not the enemy. It's not his minions. It's me, my flesh, my body, my mind. I do more damage to myself than anybody else because Amen. once you start believing the hype, and it's easy, you know, it's very easy. Um, especially when we have loving spouses who talk about, you know, oh, you're so wonderful. Yeah, well, yeah. And then you start believing how wonderful you are. Yeah. But, I mean, really, the thing that that, that we all need to watch out for is the high part of it. <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry. I, I apologize for laughing out. But if he's over there going to, you can see the I'm eyes. just checking. Well, I think, Ken, I think Ken believes the hype on him. <laughs> but, dude, I understand that. So, you know, I, I just, I just, you know, got around more. Oh, my gosh. When you hear all this stuff on the news of these mega churches, mega churches, where the pastor has been fooling around with somebody for 12 years. Well, and also another and part... And didn't think anything was wrong with it. Uh, and another That's part of it part. comes down to... In, in a lot of these churches, 
and, and usually it's the bigger churches because they're looking for dynamic speakers so they can get the people in the seats so they can get the money to come in. Yeah. And, and sadly, most Bible-reading, God-fearing pastors aren't those dynamic speakers. They're good teachers. They're good preachers. They're good at getting the message out there. But they don't wow people. I watch, I watch sermons in most of the churches around here, and I enjoy all of them. But I can't think of really any of them that I go, wow, man, he is just such a horror for words. He just really, they deliver the word, and that's what they're supposed to do. But when you get into the big churches, it's less about the godliness and the holiness of the message and more about getting people in the seats. Yeah. Well, yeah. And, and, and that's how they have to be a mega church. Well, but like when we come back to talking about people being paid for their work, I got no issue with people in the church, pastors being paid. Where, where I start really questioning is when you're making millions of dollars a year, you may be worth that, but why are you making that money? If you're, and if, why do you think you're worth it? Well, if you truly believe what you're, what you're preaching and what you're saying, unless you're one of these pastors who truly believe everybody should give everything to the church, but if you truly believe that the church is supposed to do what the church is supposed to do, then you should make a modest, honest salary that you can make a living on, you can pay your bills and all that, but you don't need a private plane. I don't care who you are. I'm sorry. You don't need a private I'd love to have a private house. plane, but... Yeah. I know. would say, Chris, the bigger the church, the more people involved, the more chances of corruption, just like the newer cars. The more technology is in a car, the more they can go wrong with it. Well, the larger the church, the more the people factor fills in. Well, it does, but and I mean... There'll be more corruption when you're a church that big. It's hard to put your hand on just one thing. Pastor Woody can put his hands, you know, on a smaller church, you get more of a grip of what's going on. But when your church is that big and you're broke down into different branches, I mean... But but also in a church that big, you have more, you should have more accountability because you got right. more people in each position overseeing each other. Unless they're crooked yeah. too. Well, but that's true in everything. <laughs> yeah. but, but I mean, ultimately what it comes down to is, is we have to hold ourselves accountable, but we need the church and our friends and our family to hold us accountability to catch it before it gets to that point. Because, like you said, 11, 12 years. It's not how did it happen. How did it happen that long? That's right. Because if you have people in your life who know you, and that, that's, that's the key to accountability is, is we know each other. We're, we're close enough to where if you come in one day, I can go, mm, something ain't right. <laughs> because I know you and I know how you are. It's that kind of thing. And, and I think... Uh, when we get into accountability, a lot of times it's, hey, we're just going to get a group of men together and we're going to say, hey, yeah, we're good. But if we don't know each other, then then we can hold each other accountable. But if we don't know uh, each other well enough to know, because that's like one one guy I know, his, his accountability groups, they have wives' phone numbers and they call the wives regularly. How's he doing? You notice him in anything? <laughs> Seriously? But, but when you start getting to a point to where you are a spiritual leader as a pastor or, or even in a large uh, uh, ministry of any type, if you don't have that type of accountability or if you don't want that type of, of accountability, then you should ask why. Because you should be in a book because of the fact of what we do. Because if we want to build the kingdom, we have to earn people's trust to build the kingdom. And to earn people's trust, we have to be open and honest so we can build a church. And that's what it's all about. It's not about us, it's about the kingdom. And, and it's hard to do that. I know as men, it's really tough. It's really, really hard to sit down with somebody and, and, and tell them the truth about all the, all the things going yeah, on. There's a lot of people that don't want to step up. Like she said, going on 12 years, I'm sure other people found out and they other knew. But who's going to be the one to step forward? Nobody, well, I'm not going to say anything was the one who came forward. Oh, it was her. She was 11 years old when this started. Yeah. You think maybe yeah, other man. people knew and they were just scared and to I, I, don't know, you know, I don't know. I just got to look at it and I'm going, and you didn't how think did your parent know? Uh, yeah. Go ahead, Deborah. I mean, you know? uh, the Bible says that we need to be quick to repent. Yes. And then in Hebrews 4, this is one of my favorite verses, Hebrews chapter 4, uh, verse 12 through... Uh, 12 and 13, for the word of God is living and effective and sharper than any two-edged sword, 
penetrating as far as to divide soul, spirit, joints, and marrow. It is a judge of the ideas and the thoughts of the heart. 13. No creature is hidden from him, but all things are naked and exposed to the eyes of him to whom we must give an account. Well, and, and, and people forget because it's like when you, and, and you know, we always, I always like talking to children because when you tell a child that God is watching them all the time, usually the thing is in the bathroom. <laughs> it's everywhere, everywhere. But but we, if if we can actually remember that that God sees every single thing we do, yes. and, and we know it, but it's, we don't know it. You know, it's almost like if He's not there physically standing, what? Because most of the stuff we do that's not right, we certainly won't do it in front of people. Right. But we do it in front of God every day. Yeah, yeah. and God, you can't wait to see. But you know, our flesh. You know, our flesh can convince us. Because, yes, the enemy, we have the spiritual warfare, and we have his minions, because the devil can't be in all places at once. He can only focus on one thing at a time. But he has a third of the angels who can who messes with everybody else. But most times, it's our flesh that convinces us. Um, and That's it's easy okay. to do, because we're all, we're all, as much as we hate to admit it, we're all fairly naive, because we know these things, we read these things, we're told these things, but yet in our minds, we go, eh. And uh, it's, it's, it's difficult. But what we have to do is we need to pray for ourselves, especially. We need to pray for others. And we need to stick together because what the enemy effectively does is divides and conquers. And that's what we see now. And, and, you know, and it, was, it was bad before. Then you got COVID and it got worse. And now... We have all these issues that are issues, but really they're not. They wouldn't be issues if the families were still sticking together and if the families were taking care of what the families need to take care of. It kind of goes back to Paul. Why don't I do the things I, should, I shouldn't do, but I do them anyway? Well, that's <laughs> yeah, that's I know true. I shouldn't, but I do them. I'm a dreadful man. Uh, back to what we were talking about. Uh, verse 22. Do not lay hands on anyone hastily nor share in other people's sins. Keep yourself pure. So, and what happens a lot of times, and, and, and a lot of times the, the, the issues start because we'll have somebody come into the church and we'll go, they know how to do this. They know how to do that. And so, from like the first or second time they're here, you're trying to shuffle them into the spot where you think that they would be most effective for the church. And, and it sounds good because I do believe that if you want people to come to church and stay in church, they need to be involved in the church and doing stuff. That's what builds the family and community. But if we rush it too much, then we get away from it being um, something we need them to do to something that could cause pride in them. Look at me. I just walked in the door. And now I'm already up on the praise and worship stage, or I'm already doing this, or I'm already doing that. Uh, we need to vet, for one, uh, because here, you know, as far as the, 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 the major, I would say, and, and every, everything everybody does in this church would be major, but when you're looking from like a business standpoint, pastors, secretaries, these areas, those are, these people have been here, they've been vetted, and we trust them. But sometimes, instead of starting, like we had discussed, and, and of course everybody's been so busy, but little volunteer jobs, like helping, maybe start helping parking and stuff like that to where people can start getting into it, we start looking at other means for them to do. And generally that happens in smaller churches because we're always shorthanded. When you get into the bigger churches, most of their positions, that's what me and Lori was talking about the other day, the churches that had VBS in the middle of the day instead of at night. Well, they had it in the middle of the day because they have church staff that works there. Um, and they're generally hired on that way, so they get a little bit more betting. Well, be careful on that parking job, because it's dangerous. Uh, I bet it is. Uh, yeah. That's why I don't go in the parking lot after I get here. People like you are coming in afterwards. <laughs> but, but really, you know, we just have to make sure that, that we vet these people and that we learn about them. And, and especially if, if, you, if you're looking at, you know, people... Because even in a church, you move up through the ranks. You know, you, every, every department has its 
hierarchy, if you will. Because uh, when we rush to these things, sometimes it can be to a point to where we don't know who they are and they don't know who we are, and then it ends up being awkward. I was talking to somebody the other day about them being involved in a church and and they had jumped in too soon and then after a while and they started seeing how the doctrine laid out and the preaching laid out it wasn't what they believed I guess uh, there, there, I mean it, it was a Christian church but there was aspects of it that really they didn't believe it didn't make them comfortable but they had got into some some of the Sunday stuff to where it was hard for them to, to ease out if that makes sense so on both sides you want to make sure of it um, because that it, it takes time to include uh, taking the appropriate time to deserve their lives and spiritual conditions as was set forth back in chapter 3 verses 1 and 1 through 7. Let me go back here so I can remind us of that. Because this was when the qualifications for the overseers about being blameless, the husband of one wife, temperate, sober-minded, of good behavior, uh, hospitable, and ability to teach. Um, these are, are things that you want to have time for. Now, if you're, which we don't do it here, but a lot of churches, when they have a committee and they go out and find a pastor, that they, they vet them that way, and it's usually a shorter period of time, but you still vet them that way. But it's important that we welcome everybody into our congregation, and we welcome everybody to come hear the Word. But if, we're going to, if they're going to start stepping into leadership type positions it's extremely important that we know who they are they know who we are and we know their spiritual condition if it would be um, 23 no longer drink only water but use a little wine for your stomach's sake and your frequent infirmities well and, and he's starting to wind the letter down now and he's just starting to hit on different things and, and apparently Timothy was from what I understand a little bit sickly uh, he had health issues and, and he must have had some digestive issues. Well, what we have to remember is back in the first century, they didn't have public water systems. They didn't have bottled water. They didn't have all the conditions that we have now. So whenever we talk about alcohol, and that always, I'm not, I don't want to get into a long discussion on that, but whenever that always comes up as if it's a sin or if it's not a sin and this, that, and the other, the wine back in the first century was used more as a, uh, what's the word? Cleanser. Medicinal. Cleanse? Well, it, to, to clean the water. In other words, you, it was more water than wine, but, but the, the fermentation in it and the alcohol in it would sterilize the water so you're less likely to get sick and have stomach issues. It's not like you go and get you know, a 1994 whatever <laughs> bottle of wine. It was, it was basically grapes that were fermented because that was safer to drink than it's safer to drink water. Because the water, you never knew when a camel might have went potty. This was there probably ran wild back then. Didn't it? Well, I, I don't know if I would say it ran Stack wild water. per se because, because you have to remember also that our bodies adapt to most things. So if... If your body, now you can't go with just horrible water, but that's like Mexico. And I don't know if it's still like that now, but I remember when I was younger, they talked about if you go to Mexico, don't drink the water. Well, they, well they're drinking the water, and it's not hurting them, but it's not hurting them. Their bodies are used to it, their immune system. It's like when we all started getting out after COVID, people were getting sick, not with COVID, but they were getting sick all over the place and were having serious colds and, and, and everything seemed to be more amplified. And that was because the whole time we were locked down, we weren't exposed to germs. We used so much antibacterial so that we couldn't get any germs. And then your immune system gets weaker. Because yeah. it's like there's, there's, um, there's organs in our body that we don't need anymore. Because the way we used to eat and the way we used to do stuff where we had all the modern technologies and all these wonderful cooking apparatuses and all that, whatever, I'm trying to think of one, I think, I don't know if it's a gallbladder or what, but I know there are organs in our body that will just totally remove if you have a problem with it and, and you just move yeah. on with life, like, like tonsils or something like that. There, when, when our bodies were created by God, these things were needed for our safety and health. But as we have made things safer and healthier, our bodies don't, they quit using them. And it's the same thing with this. 
they didn't sit around, and I'm sure when you got it, because we always read about the royalty and all that, where they would actually sit around and drink and get drunk, but the average people, they used, like with this, they used it as medicinal. Med somebody used that word for me. Medicinal. Thank you. Uh, they used it for that, and they used it for purifying water. So it wasn't like the strength that we're used yeah. to getting. Uh, See, they weren't able to keep their water moving and running at the time. They, you know, those pools of water that they brought in, like in Jerusalem, they weren't able to keep it moving. Oh. You know, it was just kind of stagnant sitting there in the sun. But, well, yeah, and, and, and that's, that's part of where people really get hung up when we go through the Bible, is they're looking in through it through 20, 21st century lenses. Right. We look at things as the world we're in now. If you want to get close to what this is, then probably if you go over to Afghanistan or go to Haiti or go to one of these third world countries where they still live in shacks and they can't get pure water, that's where it's it's hard to relate when you turn on your tap and it comes on and when you turn on your tap it doesn't, you're calling somebody going, Why is my water on? I mean it's it's we've got to a point there you don't know you don't realize you need stuff until you until can't get that stuff. Yep. <laughs> you can't get it. Yeah. Um, and again, this isn't about um, Paul telling Timothy, go get drunk. This is about, hey, you got stomach issues. Well, and, and, and I think probably, and I don't know, and again, and, and, and when we read these, we kind of try to read between the lines, and it's, it's, we probably shouldn't do that. But, but it, it's one of those things where I think probably Timothy had been told, as we read, you know, Paul, don't be a stumbling block on people. Don't. Don't don't drink if the people around you shouldn't be drinking and all that and and if he's not doing it because he feels like he's making people stumble but it's like people who don't take their medicine because for whatever reason they don't take their medicine because I'm a world of words of not taking medicine but it, but it's kind of that thing it's, he's not saying go get drunk he's saying take your medicine so you'll feel better uh, 24 and 25. Some men's sins are clearly evident, preceding them to judgment. But those of some men follow later. Likewise, the good works of some are clearly evident, and, and those that are otherwise cannot be hidden. So he's reminding Timothy that sin and good works can both be obvious. Not all the time, but, but they can. But mm -hmm. And it's like I've been told, um, and I'm sure people have heard it from other places, is you're going to live who you are. You can say what, what, who you are all day long, but if you spend enough time with somebody, you'll know if what they say is truly who they are. And that's why on this, Paul is, is encouraging Timothy to, to take your time, spend time, because he's looking at building, putting leadership in the church. That's what this part of it is all about, um, is making sure that, that he leans on the Holy Spirit, talk to the people, pray over it, spend time with them and find out who they really are. Because I am sure in this day and time when, when Christianity is coming into these places, you're not coming into people who've been Christians for years and years and years. You're, you're either dealing with Jews or you're dealing with uh, people who worship other gods and you're trying to get them the right information and you're trying to get leadership in this church and you're trying to make sure that they've got the right information. It's hard enough now when you've got people who supposedly know what they're doing and you're trying to, it reminds me of when we started Trail Life. You're trying to get a bunch of people to do a bunch of stuff we don't know what we're doing, but you need to get it right, so you got to work real hard to get them to do it. You know, <laughs> and, and, and that, that whole, you know, being a church plant in the United States, I don't think is probably as difficult as being a church plant in, say, China, you know, where you're going in and, and, and these people don't know the... Uh, they don't know. I mean, just, they don't know anything. So you're trying to teach them. So basically he's saying, especially with all the false teachers and everything that, that he has talked about through this, and if you've been through, um, I know we went through 1 John, 2 John, 3 John, on RCCTV, and that's what they are. Well, that's where a lot of the Bible is, is everybody's got their own opinion. And opinions are great to a point, but when you're talking about this book, there's no opinions. It is what it is. Um, there's just areas that are not crystal clear and that's where the problems come what amazes me is when it is crystal clear and you still got people going but that's not true and you're going but that's what it says but that's not true because I heard a, a, a leader in, in, in one of the I guess we'll say denominations uh, you know basically saying that 
this isn't important. We're supposed to just be friendly to people. And, and, and the person that said it, I was like, wow, that's, that's, that's a big deal. Um, but when it's sitting here in front of you, because and, and, it's like a lot of things, and, and that's the world we live in now anyways, you know, you're a man, and somebody goes, well, no, he's not. <laughs> yeah, he is. Well, no, he's not. You know, when, when, when we have the obvious right in front of us and we're still having to argue, more or less, about what is what, it, it can get frustrating. And that's why we always have to be on guard. And that's why it's so important to know this book. Because as I was telling Bobby today, um, he, he wanted to preach a little bit, so he brought his Bible in there. And, but he was all over the place, but he was talking about Eve and the fruit and how Satan lied. And I said, no, 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 Satan didn't lie. Satan asked, did God really say? So most false teachers aren't actually lying to you. They're just putting doubt in your mind about what Scripture really says. And that's why it's so important we need to know it, because the doubt is what gets us in so much trouble. Uh, because as Pastor Woody has said, and we've heard from many times, you know, if you don't know what the Scripture says, then don't necessarily talk about it, because that Scripture, one word can change the whole meaning of it. And I'm horrible at remembering Scripture, but, you know, I... Thanks to Pastor Woody and, and, and the other teachers I listen to, I know what they mean, and, and, and you need to be able to articulate. And if you don't, then pass them off to somebody who can, because it's important that we know exactly what it says, because that's where a lot of people get in trouble, and that's why we have so many denominations. So many denominations. One book, and there's more denominations, I think, than there are verses in the Bible. So, um, so that is chapter... I mean, that's chapter 5. We're going to move into chapter 6. And I'm going to try to move up a little bit faster. 1 and 2, please. That is, many bond servants that are, as are under the yoke count their own masters worthy of all honor, so that the name of God and His doctrine may, be, may not be blasphemed. And those who have believing masters, let them not despise them, because they are brethren. But rather serve them because those who are benefited are believers and beloved. Teach and exhort these things. So in the new in the New King James it's called bond servants. In the NIV it's slaves. I know that a lot of times people get hung up on that. Uh, we're not going to get into all that. But basically the best way to look at it in this day and time in the world we live in is employer and employee. And what it all comes down to is what Paul says in Colossians chapter 3 verses 24 and 20 I mean 23 and 24 and whatever you do do it heartily as to the Lord and not to men know that from the Lord you will receive the reward of the inheritance for you serve the Lord Christ everything we do irregardless of who it's for we should do it the best we can and, and do it like we're working for the Lord. Because we are working for the Lord. The Lord places us in the jobs, doing the things we do. Sometimes we want to know why. Sometimes we wish He wouldn't. But reality is, God's going to put us where He needs us to be. And, and, and it's not that He can't do this without us. It's He wants to bless us. And He puts us in a position so we can be blessed. Now, we may not always see it as a blessing, but God has a plan. And God is going to make sure that plan is brought to fruition. And we should just feel blessed that we are allowed to be a part of it, even when it's kind of difficult to do. Um, and again, you know, if your boss is a Christian, treat him as well as you can. If he's not a Christian, treat him as well as you can. And just as difficult as it can be at times, be that light. That's, that's the important part. Uh, let's go on to 3 through 5. If anyone teaches otherwise and does not consent to wholesome words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, and to the doctrine which accords with godliness, he is proud, knowing nothing, but is obsessed with disputes and arguments over words, from which come envy, strife, reviling, 
evil suspicions and less useless wrangling of the men of corrupt minds and destitute of truth who suppose that godliness is a means of gain from which withdraw yourself. So Paul points out three characteristics of, of false teachers. Uh, they're teach otherwise, teaching in contra contradiction to God's uh, revelation of Scripture, uh, does not consent to wholesome words, they, they don't accept the sound doctrine, healthy teaching that is contained in Scripture, and number three, they do not adhere to the doctrine which accords with godliness. Um, their teaching is not based on Scripture. This type of teaching will always result in unholy life. So, instead of uh, godliness, false, false teachers will always be marked by sin. And, and again, if, if we know the scripture, it makes it so much more difficult for them to follow. Um, or not for them to follow, for us to follow them. And you can follow false teachings a lot easier if you know your scriptures. You can, you can, well, you can catch an eyes when people are yeah. blowing smoke at you. I mean, because the big things we need to remember is there's no new revelations. What's in God's word is in God's word. There's nothing new. God hasn't changed his mind. And there's denominations and, and, and leaders in, in certain denominations that spouse that God has changed his mind. Well, he hasn't. Mm -hmm. uh, we actually had that discussion not on, on that subject line. Change but the will of God. Does God change his mind? We had that discussion. But God's will does not change. God has a plan and, and he's going to complete it. And, and when we go back, because a lot of people say, well, God does change his mind, because this is what we were discussing. You know, look at with Moses. He was going to wipe out all the Israelites. And, and um, Moses prayed and he didn't do it. And we were talking about, uh, was it Elijah? Yeah. This last week about the, the child dying and him praying and the child being brought back to life. Well, since God is all knowing, all seeing, and he knows everything that's going to happen, he can't change his mind because he already knew what was going to happen. Changing your mind means you don't necessarily know how it's going to end and you change your mind to change the, the outcome. Well, he already knows the outcome. But he, he listens to our prayer and I think sometimes he makes it look as though he changed his mind. So we will um, know he listens to our prayer and also as, as we were talking about, especially like with the, the, the child dying and, and we saw Jesus do it throughout his time, is it's a sign that God is there. When you bring something back from the dead back to life, then it's a sign that God is indeed there. And a lot of times that's... God was being is. glorified by bringing uh, it Let's see. Uh, and and we've, I think we've covered this before. We shouldn't quarrel. We shouldn't argue about Scripture. Um, even if, even if we're, we're mature uh, in, in the Scriptures and in, in the Bible, you never know when an immature person is listening on and if we're going to argue about it then a lot of people are just not interested in being involved in it. Um, so we, we can have discussions like this where you're studying the Bible and all that but we've all seen people argue over what this scripture means or what that scripture means um, and it's, it's not healthy uh, because most of the arguments when it comes to scripture are on secondary things that they're in the Bible, so therefore they're important, but they don't affect our salvation like the triune God and, and the gospel, the death, burial, and resurrection. It's, it's usually on secondary things that, you know, well, what did they mean by that? Well, as we go through the Bible, it's nice to know those things, but it's really not important enough to argue over. Chris, wouldn't it be fair to say the same thing kind of with Lazarus? Is Jesus could have saved Lazarus without actually going down there to save Lazarus. He could have just spoke it and made it happen, but well, Jesus you know, brought Jesus, Lazarus back to life for his disciples' sake. Right, he, he wanted everybody to see yes. the the power of God because Jesus didn't have to travel all the way down there and say Lazarus. I mean, he could have healed Lazarus from wherever he was. You know, they said you didn't come to heal him when he called you. Jesus could heal him right where he was standing. Well, he healed the. Uh, oh. Who was it? It was the uh, centurion. centurion. Yep, the centurion's yeah. servant. He healed because the centurion right. said, I'm not even worthy of you coming to my house. Uh -huh. And Jesus said, well, because of your faith 
Well, he said, I haven't seen any faith like this in Israel. Was mad at the rest of us. Look at this guy. He has faith that I don't even have to go there. Well, that happens. You know? but, but yeah, I mean, the, the things that are done, the miracles that are done, are generally not done because it helps you or helps you. They're done so people can see that God is real, <clears throat> that God is present in these places. Uh, a lot of times that gets bogged down with the smart people who think they figured it out, but you know that's, that's totally different. Yeah. And, and with fa- and, and and I think a lot most of the time with with false teachers, it, it's that whole follow the money thing. They're not doing it for God's glory, and they're not doing it for God's kingdom. They're doing it for their own glory and for their own uh, pocket, usually. Um, and I'm not saying that pastors who make a lot of money and have a lot of stuff are false teachers. I'm just saying that generally, if you're going to go to the effort to be a false teacher, you're usually in it. For the, for, for the glory of yourself, which usually ends up with money. All right, uh, verses 6 through 8. Now by the this, with contentment, it is great gain. For we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we can carry nothing out. But having food and clothing with these, we shall be content. We all heard that, and it's true. I mean... You know, we, we seem to spend most of our lives, I know when I was younger, I did, I spent most of my life trying to uh, acquire things. And now I've got a bunch of stuff I've acquired, and I wish I didn't have a lot of it. Uh, because it's more work than it's worth. But, but the world tells us that he who dies with the most toys wins. But that's not true. You know, and, and, and one of the things that, that, you know, in this study that, that I come across when it talks about the, where was it at? Well, the world judges you by how much stuff you got. Well, yeah, but we as, we as Westerners, it's hard to, to think about being content, verse 8, and having food and clothing with, with these, we shall be content. It, you know, when we have all the stuff we got, and there's all the stuff out there, and we do all the things we do, it's hard to think that if, as long as we got food, clothing, and a roof over our head, that we'd be content, because if the roof doesn't include a TV and a bathroom and and a hot tub and, and all these other things, how can we be happy with it? But it's like I told a guy that I worked with in Atlanta one time, our poor here is not poor. In, in, in the scheme of the Western, uh, Western living, they're poor. But if you want to see poor, you go to Afghanistan, you go to Haiti, you go to these other countries to where they don't have a roof over their head. I remember when we went to uh, Carlsbad, I wanted to come back through um, What's the Texas town down there south of uh, El Paso? I want to come back to El Paso because at El Paso you've got all these nice big houses and buildings on this side, and then there's a fence, and then there's cardboard boxes and stuff. Yeah, you know, it's 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 all in. Caves with the shoe over. Yeah, and when you have nothing, and then, I mean, and there are people I see them in Dallas every day when I leave work, living under the bridges, food, clothes, and a roof over their head. Girlfriend. Well, yeah, everybody got to have a cell phone now. <laughs> but, but anyways, I mean, basically what this is saying is we brought nothing in. No matter what we acquire <coughs> while we're alive, we're not going to take with us. Amen. Um, and, and I think uh, Kenneth's thing he said the other day sums it up. What was it you said you're going to tell your kids? I spent the money. I spent the money. <laughs> you know, let everybody, let everybody enjoy their own wealth, not take yours with you. Yeah, I anyway. my kids like he said, oh, spend your own money, Mom. Yes. He said, oh, you said, that sounds so good. I may do. I wish I had a sister. That's right. All right. Uh, well, we'll never know the, the feeling of going out and earning and working and creating their own lives if you're just constantly giving them everything. They, they miss a lot of what it likes to earn. But yeah, you go to a lot of these private schools and stuff like that, and you see all that. Kids don't leave me $47. 47 dollars <laughs> Uh, uh, verses 9 and 10. But those who desire to be rich fall into temptation and a snare and into many foolish and harmful lusts which drown, drown men in destruction and perdition. For the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil for which some have strayed from the faith in their greediness and pierced themselves through many uh, with many sorrows. So we all hear the root of money, the money is the root of all evil. Well, it's not the root of all evil. There's nothing wrong with money. It's the people 
It's, it's kind of like the gun debate. You know what? Guns don't kill people. People kill people. Well, you know what? Money, money doesn't corrupt people. People corrupt themselves because of money. Uh, and, and when you're talking about our world we live in now, basically the two biggest temptations that, well, it's not just our world. If you look at the great empires of the world throughout history, including the one we're living in now, money and sexual immorality is what ultimately is the downfall. It's not another entity or another empire coming in to destroy it. It's always destroyed from the inside. Yeah. And it, like I said, I'm not saying that you shouldn't have money. I'm not saying that you shouldn't um, earn money. But when money is your God, it's going to destroy you eventually. Um, if it doesn't destroy you on this side, because it was your God, you've been destroyed when you go to the other side. So it's important to remember that, that money is important to living. Uh, missionaries, uh, ministries, ministries, missionaries, churches, we need money to survive. But it's all in how it is viewed. Is it viewed as a tool or is it viewed as God? And too many times, and, and I've been, you know, I've been uh, in that trap too, you know, well, Hey, I made this money, now I can make this money. Well, if I cut that corner, I can make that money. If I cut that corner, and it ends up being, you know, some of the most God-fearing people out there cheating on their taxes, and they think it's okay. Well, it's not. We're, we're not to do that in any way. Uh, 11 through 14. But you, O oh man of God, flee these things and pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, gentleness. Fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold on eternal life to which you were also called and have confessed the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. I urge you in the sight of God who gives life to all things and before Christ Jesus, who witnessed the good confession before Pontius Pilate, that you keep this commandment without spot, blameless, until our Lord Jesus Christ appearing. Flee. We hear that a lot, um, and it is important. I mean, we're supposed to stand and stand up for our faith, but there's some things, like Joseph did with Potiphar's wife, there's some things that you don't stand and try to stand against. If you are weak in a specific area of your walk, flee. I mean, it's, it's important. Uh, it's like we talk about, you know, we go through things so we can help other people in those things. Uh, but like if you are a lifelong drunk or alcoholic, and, and you shouldn't be in a bar trying to help people quit drinking. You should flee. You don't need that temptation. And and if you, you know, that's like uh, sexual immorality is, is always a big thing in the church and all that. And I remember hearing a story about um, uh, Billy Graham and his entourage. They were never in a room with a woman who wasn't their wife alone. They always had somebody else in the room with them. And I personally think that's very important because even if nothing happens, it gives the appearance something may happen. And even then, somebody may accuse you of something and if there's nobody there, they automatically think that... Uh, because, again, it's not whether or not the accusation is true. It's we have to take it seriously because it was made. Um, they were standing in and left the door open. I mean, he always left the door open. He wouldn't even get in the elevator if there was just him and a woman. Right. I mean, it's, it, there's no sense in putting yourself in a position um, where something can happen. It's, again, Ferrari. Or give anybody room to talk about you, even. Well, it's like Steve Ferrari. You know, he always talks about uh, generic things. He never gives names or anything. But he was, said he was talking to a guy, and he was talking about this wonderful book that... that that him and one of his friends, it, it, it was a marriage book, you know, building your marriage, and he was going through with one of his coworkers, and he was talking about how great it was, and and, and Steve said he was listening, and then he happened to notice that this coworker was a woman, and he's like, "You're going through a book on marriage with another woman?" He said, "Oh yeah, and all this," and he said, after a few minutes, he listened. He said, "Well, in six months, y'all will be sleeping together." And the guy lost his mind, and within three months, they were sleeping together. Um, <laughs> But, but what happens is you put yourself in this position to where, you know, we talk. Me and Carolyn talk a lot. Well, Carolyn understands me. She gets me. And, and she's much more understanding than my wife. Well, 
that's probably because you don't know me like my wife knows me. <laughs> but I mean, that's true. It's easy to be understanding to somebody who you don't know them and you don't know how they act. So, so anytime you get yourself in a position, or especially if it's a position you know that you have issues with, flee, run, get out of it, stay away from it. Always have a plan. That's what I tell the guys in my men's group. You know, if, if you wait until something happens to make a decision of how you're going to handle it, you're going to fail. You need to have a plan ahead of time. And again, church. I mean, the, the Bible never talks about Joseph and his plan for that. But I don't think that he just went, "Ooh, I got to run." I think he had a plan the whole time that he knew what he was going to do if something like that happened. Well, she got a hold of his jacket and left evidence. Uh, let's see. Let's uh, fifteen sixteen. Try to get my rest of this knocked out in five minutes. Which he will manifest in his own time. He who is blessed and only potent. The King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, who alone has immorality dwelling in an unapproachable light, whom no man has seen or can see, to whom be honor and everlasting power. Amen. Paul again, as he ends most of the stories, he's listening up to the Lord. Even with everything he's been through, all the the, the the tragedy and everything, he still lifts the Lord up in prayer, exalting him, glorifying him. Um, we all have to remember that God is in control of everything and He is sovereign. And again, that's when we think about, you know, that, that God may not see our sins, that He is sovereign. He sees all things. Uh, as we talked about earlier, you know, if we start thinking more highly of ourselves than we should, then that's when we get into trouble, when we start thinking we're all that in a box of rocks. You know, we gotta mm -hmm. we got to make sure we, we are humble because we're not God. Only God knows those things. And, and to keep our lives from spinning out of control, we need to remember that God is God, sovereign. Anytime we have an issue, we need to remember that God is sovereign. Whatever is going on in our lives, if we lean on God, He is sovereign. Yes. And we know that He is in control. Whether we like it or not, He is in control. And I have to say that since I come to the revelation in my mind and, and, and accepted that He's in control, my life is easier because even when things go bad, I know he's in control. And whatever happens is his will. He's got it. Amen. All right, uh, 17 through 19. The man knows who are rich in this present age, not to be haughty, nor to trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God, who gives us richly all things to enjoy. Let them do good, and they be rich in good works, ready to give, willing to share, storing up for themselves, a good foundation from, for the time to come that they may lay hold on eternal life. And uh, apparently I got a whole lot further ahead of myself than I thought. But I mean, we've already discussed this about the money. A money in itself is not evil if, if it's used for the right things and we hold it in the right place. I mean, it, it's that simple. But it's really hard to <clears> hold <throat> it in the right place because, you know, they say that money don't buy happiness, but Sometimes stuff will get you happy for a little while. Not for eternity, but it'll get you happy for a little while. All right, uh, 20 and 21, and we'll wrap this up. O oh, Timothy, guard what was committed to your trust, avoiding the profane and idle babbling and contradictions of what is falsely called knowledge. By professing it, some have stayed, according, stayed concerning the faith. Grace be with you. Amen. Amen. I, I love how he says in 20, and contradictions of what is falsely called knowledge. Do we not live in a world of all this knowledge that is contradictory to even science? That's contradictory to nature. It's, it's not just, you know, and, and of course it's contradictory to the Bible, but even the non-believers, the things they, they espouse to believe in nature and they believe in, in science and, and it goes against it and they still go, well, this is true. Even though it goes against everything I said was true yesterday, it's true. But I guess the truth is all relative, and your truth and my truth are not the same truth, and you, you can just do whatever you want. But the people end up in misery, in absolute misery. Um, and, and it's sad, and, and you hate to see it, because there are a lot of people, a lot of good people in this world who are messed up because they listen to the wrong people. Uh, but, again, he's telling Timothy just to... You know, pay attention, keep going, as we all should. You know, know, know your doctrine and and just stick to it no matter what anybody else says. Don't be swayed by the immoral or the, the lies of other people. Um, 
Well, Chris, I, I highlighted 18, you know, because many times tonight you kept saying, you know, that money, don't be all wrapped up in the money is, you know, in, in storing up your own earthly riches. But 18, it really goes into command them to be good and do, and be rich in good deeds. You know, instead of trying to pile up all this money and all your stuff, you can't take it to heaven. Like I said, you can't take it with you is what I was trying to get at. But here, what you can take with you is, you know, all the things that you did serving the church and being rich in good deeds and generous and willing to share. And this way, you will uh, lay up treasures in heaven, pretty much. Well, and, and it's like when we talk about give 10%, everybody always first thing to think of is 10% of your money. Let's give ten percent, ten percent of your best. That's why. That's why. And, and you know, to me, it's when you have time to sit down and have your quiet time in the Bible. But a lot of people say that you should do it first thing in the morning to give your first 10, best ten percent. Now, anybody that knows me knows that that first ten percent of my morning, I am not at my best <laughs> uh, because I'm trying to wake up. But but when when and I want to right well, yeah. I mean, this morning getting up at, at when I got up at nine o'clock, I don't remember the last time I got up at nine o'clock and I felt wonderful. Yeah. I forgot how good it was to climb out of bed at nine o'clock. But but when we talk about giving, yes, we you know, churches and, and ministries they need money. But in a lot of cases, people will give money to get out of actually doing. Doing deeds. And we need we need we need as much or more doing than we need money a lot of the time. It's just hard sometimes it's harder for people to give up their time. They just throw money in the plate and go, well, I did my deed. You know, a lot of things, it's easier to throw money on, on stuff than it is actually your time and, and taking time to spend with somebody because your money in that plate ain't bringing anybody to Jesus. Well, and, and it again, ain't, but we need it. <laughs> no, I, no, you can't your be point, like money without money. Yeah, sure. but what he's talking about is people want to give money They instead. use that excuse not to serve. And, yeah. and ultimately, we should give Financially, we should give physically, and we should give spiritually. We should give of those three things. And there's probably more that I'm not thinking of right now, but those are the most important things. Because, again, when we're worshiping God, we are not worshiping God like this. We are worshiping God within our spirit, within our bodies. That's how we worship God. Because that's where people get into trouble a lot of times, and they don't realize it is that cross right there. I've got to get on my knees, and I've got to worship it cross. Well, that's idolatry. You have to worship the Lord. Um, so we will uh, wrap it up. Um, all I can say about 1 Timothy is it's a great book. We've been through it and I think y'all say it. And a lot of people don't like to go through the Timothys because they say it's for church leadership. It's not. It's for everybody. If you're a leader, you need to read it. If you're not a leader, you need to read it so you know what your leaders are supposed to be doing. I mean, and that's as important as anything. All right, so, uh, Kenneth, uh, we Let me pray go something? into that. Okay. Uh, Jenna has asked for prayers, of course, her and her animals, uh, church family, Chris and, and your family, uh, friends and family, her brother, JD, and everyone else. Linda Moy says it was a good lesson tonight, and uh, that's all we have here. Thank you, everybody online. Uh, I'll go ahead and just say, uh, if y'all ever come in next week, we'd love to see you. If not, we'll be happy to see you online. Go ahead. Father God, thank you for teaching us tonight. We learned so much in First Timothy. We learned a lot about how our church to run, leadership, and most of all, how we should be treating each other. Mm. Dear Lord, we lift up our prayer book to you. You know all the names in that book and you have an answer for each one I, I know. Lord, I know you're sovereign, but we still lift our country up and with the com upcoming election, we would love to see these politicians turn toward you instead of the world. We also pray tonight for our church ministries and our church growth. And as we grow, we personally, I hope we grow and, and do Great works for you, Lord. And as I always ask you, Lord, God, protect our first responders, military, our police, and our political leaders. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Again, y'all. I have a perfect sticker and decal. I did that first. Where was you at? I thought she was sitting right there. Okay. Anyway, we'll see y'all next week. We will start uh, 2 Timothy next week. So uh, y'all have a good week.